If you have a copy of God's Word, please take it and turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm excited this morning to do what I'm calling as a wrap-up of the Gospel of John. I want to start by just saying how thankful I am for each of you and to commend you. We started our journey through the Gospel of John in December of 2020. We finished it last week, and um, I just want to say how thankful I am for each of you. It's a sign of health and maturity in a congregation that you're coming week after week to hear God's Word, not to be wowed or entertained by a speaker, but to really hear from the Lord. And so thank you for doing that. We want to say that our goal is to make the regular rhythm of our services revolve around hearing the Word of God. We want the Word of God to shape us. And so it's my pleasure as your pastor to do what I'm trying to do is called expositional preaching. We want to walk through books of the Bible, verse by verse, section by section, chapter by chapter, because we really believe it's in hearing from the Lord that uh, we're changed. As a personal note, it's also really freeing for me because every morning, Monday morning I wake up not wondering what I'm going to preach on the next week. It's set, it's the next passage we're walking through. But as an aside, it also forces us to deal with things we otherwise maybe not cover. It forces us to work through difficult passages, difficult texts that really shape the maturity of a congregation. I'm thankful that our maturity as a church family is not tied to my own spiritual maturity or my own insights or thoughts, but to the Word of God. So I'm thankful that you've been a part of that. One of the notes I want to make is that as we've walked through John, one of the things that we've tried to do is to be focused on the text of the Gospel of John. I've tried to focus our attention on John's intention in writing this gospel. So we've mentioned other gospels. We've mentioned Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We've mentioned other verses as they're relevant to the passage before us. But we've tried to make it our focus to say, what is John communicating through these passages of Scripture about who Jesus is? This is important because what we're doing as we preach and hear God's Word preached is different than apologetics. There's a difference between apologetics and biblical interpretation and preaching. Apologetics is defending the truthfulness of the Bible. And I've assumed in every passage of Scripture that I've taught that the Bible indeed is true. And I believe every one of these counts as true. But I've not spent a lot of time every week getting into archaeology or into history to try to prove these are true. We've assumed them as face value as such. The reason that's so important is because if I were able Imagine if I were able to go back in time, let you take your iPhone, and you recorded Jesus walking on water. You got it. You recorded it. You watched it happen. You watched him calm the storm. And you brought it back, and we set John 6 on one side of the table, and we set your recording on the other side. Which of these two should we pay attention to? Now, some of you might say, well, I'd kind of like to see the, the video. I'd like to see it in person. And that's an apologetic kind of mindset. I want to see that it actually happened. But here's the problem. The reason we should always bend towards John 6 is because John 6 is the Holy Spirit-inspired camera of God showing us what He wants us to see. When I held the camera going back in time, I was zooming in and zooming out on things. I was paying attention to things and ignoring other things. But what we have in the Gospel of John in all of Scripture together is the Holy Spirit working through the authors of the Bible in such a way that God is showing us what He wants us to pay attention to. So what have we done? Consequently, what we've done is we've tried to say every week, what is John's intention in writing what he wrote? In fact, if you're taking notes, I want you to write that phrase down, author's intention. Just as a preliminary comment, author's intention. I'm not interested when I'm reading my Bible and figure out what, it feel, what I feel like it says. My primary goal is not to find myself in the story. What I'm primarily trying to do as I read the Bible is understanding the author's intention. Why is this written? What's the point that the author's trying to make? And I'm looking at grammar, syntax, what's coming before a story, what's coming after it, to try to make sense of John's purpose. Here's the really good news about the Gospel of John, though. John is not cagey about what his purpose is. John is crystal clear on his purpose, and I want you to notice it in John chapter 20, verse 30. As we wrap up the Gospel of John, I want to go back to this purpose statement in John chapter 20, verse 30. 
Listen to what the Word of God says. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that, purpose clause, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So is John a neutral writer just randomly putting stories together? No, he's not. Is John just purposeless and trying to tell us a few things about Jesus? No, he's not. He has a very strategic agenda and purpose that's filtered through everything that he's brought to us. The Holy Spirit inspired John to write this gospel for a purpose, and it's been our aim to live within and follow that purpose. There are two ideas in this purpose that I want you to notice. We're not going to put them on the screen, but you can write them down. Two ideas that are really significant from this purpose statement. The first is the phrase, life in his name. Did you notice that? John says he wants us to experience life in his name. Now, I believe this is synonymous in John's gospel with the idea of eternal life. There's a connection there. Eternal life, we learned, was not just a quantity to life, but a quality to life, right? It's not just that Jesus gives me a life that never ends. It's that he gives me a new life in which I experience a richness and fullness to what God designed life to be. What's underneath this idea of life in his name, though, is the doctrine of union with Christ. Union with Christ. It's the idea that what happens when you come to Christ is Jesus, by faith in the work of the Spirit, establishes a connection between his children and between himself. There's a connection between every believer and Jesus through which what happened to Jesus physically has happened to us spiritually. What happened to Jesus physically? He died. In the power of the Spirit, he was raised to new life. If you've come to know Christ, you've been united to Jesus in such a way that you've died to yourself and you've risen again to new life. This is what Paul meant in Galatians 2.20 where he said... I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave me, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what this means is grace is more than a pill. It's a person. Grace is more than just a message. It's a man. Grace is more than just a moment in the past. It's a connection that's established between Christ and myself that lasts forever. Life in his name is also something John talked about in terms of the mission of Christ. Early in the Gospel of John, he talked about as the Father has sent him, so he's sending us. That you and I experience Christ most powerfully when we participate in his mission. We define the mission of Christ as we work through the text as experiencing and proclaiming Christ's priesthood and his kingship. Christ is the priest who dies in our place. He's also the king who rises again with authority and power to transform our lives. Real life in his name then is not a passive idea, it's an active idea. We experience the grace of God most powerfully when we live out the mission of Christ most consistently. You want to experience Christ's grace in your life, live out the mission of Christ that he's given you in his life. So the first idea is life in his name. That's the first idea in this purpose statement. But the second idea is belief. Write that down if you're taking notes. The verb here is belief. Look back at verse 31. It says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now remember, anytime you see repetition in your Bibles, you should pay attention. Belief here is mentioned twice. It's saying that the response we're to have to Jesus, who is the Son of God, who's fully God, the response we're to have to Jesus, who is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promised, is to believe. Now you'll remember that in the New Testament, belief is not just acceptance of the truth, it's reliance on the truth. It's not just agreement with the facts of the gospel, it's dependence on them. 
Faith is more than just assenting to the fact that, yes, Jesus died. It's trusting your life to him. In fact, I would say in, in modern kind of contemporary language, anytime you see the word faith or believe, also think trust. Think trust. Because I think in our cu- current cultural moment, it helps us understand that there's this active part of faith, where a lot of times we think of faith as just an intellectual thing. The New Testament says, no, faith is not just an intellectual idea. It's also an experiential concept. And what Jesus says here, or what John says about Jesus, is faith is how we continue to live in Christ. This is important because all of us are trusting and believing in something. You're either trusting and believing in Christ, or you're trusting and believing in yourself. This is so embedded in our culture that a lot of us don't even realize it's impacting us. This past week, um, the New York University gave an honorary doctorate to Taylor Swift. Anybody know who Taylor Swift is in here? Anybody know? Nobody knows who Taylor Swift is in here? Okay, come on. You can admit it. You know who she is. And in this commencement speech that she gave, I want you to listen to her concept of faith and trust that's here. This is what she said in her commencement speech. I know it can really be overwhelming to figure out who you want to be, who you are now, and how to act to get where you want to go. Listen to this very carefully. I have good news. It's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you to you. Now, what is that? That's an idea of faith. It's faith in yourself. Trust yourself. Follow your heart. Believe yourself. Look within yourself and find the true you and push anyone aside who disagrees with who you really are. This is why, as I've mentioned over and over again, anxiety is on the rise in our culture because we've so lifted up autonomy and independence that we've pressured an entire generation to figure out things they are not equipped to figure out. Autonomy, anxiety go together in our culture. That's what you see happening in this this quote. Faith in Christ, though, means that the Word of God, the Word of Christ, shapes how I think, how I feel, and how I act. The connection between these ideas is this, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Faith in Christ unlocks life with Christ. If you want to experience all that Christ has for you as it relates to life in His name, the way you do that is by walking, trusting, not yourself, not your beliefs, not your opinions, but trusting Christ. Now, here's what I do with the time I have remaining, very ambitiously, and I did it in the first service and I survived. I'm still here to tell you about it. I want to walk through the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John to show you the different facets and dimensions to life in his name. What does it mean to experience Christ in 2022? What is he promising us? What does faith unlock? We're going to look at the seven I am states of Jesus, Jesus, and each one of these, as we unpack it, we're going to see how it impacts the life that Jesus has promised us. Are you ready? Flipping your Bibles over to John chapter 6. We're going to walk through these rather briskly. John 6, as we see Jesus as the bread of life. John chapter 6, look at verse 35. Jesus is first the bread of life. Now, the context here is important. Jesus has been feeding the 5,000. It's the Passover. He's got thousands of people flocking to him. And if Jesus wanted to take over Jerusalem by force, he has an army here to do it with. He could snap a finger, work these people up, and become Spartacus, right? Rebellion right here. But instead, he begins to teach. And as he teaches, he makes this, as he teaches, he makes this comment. Go verse 35. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Jesus says here that he alone satisfies us. What you experience through life in his name is a soul-satisfying grace. I'm not constantly looking for the next thing, for the next phone, the next house, the next job, the next promotion, the next car, the next pair of shoes. There's a deep contentment to my life. You know, the comedian Jim Carrey is famous for saying that he wishes everyone knew what wealth feels like so they can know how empty it is. 
said, I wish everybody could know what phenomenal wealth feels like so that they could know how empty and fleeting that feeling really is. The kind of contentment Jesus is talking about here isn't something that just shows up when your circumstances magically align. It isn't always getting what you want. It's not just money in your bank account or power and position. The contentment Jesus is talking about here is experiencing the fact that Christ loves you deeply. That Christ is content with you. That Christ loves you. Faith in Christ then unlocks real deep satisfaction from Christ. Number two, Jesus is not just the bread of life, though. He's the light of the world. The Gospel of John also shows that Jesus is the light of the world. Flip over in your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Jesus has just forgiven the adulterous woman. By the way, I think is my favorite story in the Gospel of John because it's this beautiful coming together of grace and truth. She repents. Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. It's this beautiful coming together, this beautiful balance to the gospel that we always need to strive for. Grace, truth, no condemnation, righteousness, and holiness. But Jesus has also been debating with the Pharisees. He's in these debates back and forth, back and forth. In the midst of this, in verse 12, he says these words. Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. What that means is he gives true sight. He opens our eyes to see things as they really are. On the one hand, Jesus shows us who God is. God is grace and truth. He's not just some angry deity going to zap us. He's loving and kind and righteous and holy. He's not one or the other. He's both and. Jesus is the light of the world. Shows us who we are. We're not main characters. We're supporting characters. We exist for the glory of God. Jesus shows us the world. Helps us see who the, how the world really functions. He helps us see that sin is the ultimate problem and Christ is the ultimate solution. It's the Sherlock Holmes effect, right? Where he says to Watson, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. In Christ, we see and we observe. We make sense of the world. We understand why things are happening the way that they're happening. Tomorrow, it's possible. News outlets are correct, which, you know, it's on the internet, so it must be true, right? News outlets are correct. It's possible tomorrow the Supreme Court will hand down a decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. If you've been watching the conversation of the last two weeks since that brief was released, much of the attack and much of the frustration in our culture is towards religious people. What they're saying is, well, you guys are pushing your beliefs in the public square. Well, setting aside for the moment that we can make a pro-life argument just from science, just from the science alone of when life begins, when conception actually happens, you want to follow the science, let's follow the science in this idea. Setting aside that for a moment, what people are unwilling to see is their own biases. They're unwilling to see that for the past 50 years, we've held up this belief in radical autonomy so much so that we think we can kill a human life. Now, what is that? That's just fact? No, that's a belief that someone has that's shaped culture. Why can't people see that? (laughs) Because apart from Christ, your eyes are closed. You're deceived. You can't see the truth. You can't see your own biases. This idea of the light of the world sets up the idea of wisdom. A little commercial for the summer. We are going to walk through the book of Proverbs this summer rather briskly. We're going to walk through the book of Proverbs talking about the idea of wisdom. That wisdom is this ability to diagnose and prescribe a course of action that I can see things as they are and see a way to live in light of them. Faith in Christ then unlocks eye-opening, perspective-defining truth. What does life in His name look like? It looks like my eyes being opened. Number three, this passage also teaches us that Jesus is the door. Write that down if you're taking notes. He's the door, or some of your translations will say the gate. The gate. Flip over to John chapter 10. 
John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 9. Now, the context here is in chapter 9, Jesus has opened the eyes of a blind man, a man born blind. And though the religious leaders still can't see, Jesus uses a very familiar analogy to help them understand who he is. He starts talking about sheep and shepherds and sheep pen, which have been culturally at that time very, very familiar to them. So in John chapter 10, verse 9, he says this. Look at with me there in your Bibles. I am the gate or door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, I taught you this several weeks ago. When we worked through this passage, I told you about a story about a pastor who went to this region of the world, and he was seeing a sheep pen, and it was this kind of rock kind of formation there with a hole at the front of it. And he looked at the shepherd who was showing him around and said, hey, I noticed your sheep pen's got a hole. Where's the door? Where's the gate? And the shepherd said very famously, I'm the door. I'm the gate. I sleep at the hole every night, and nothing comes in or out with going through me. Jesus is the door. He's the gate. He's the path to true life, to true pasture. This is an affirmation of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and faith in Christ is the only way to experience forgiveness and grace. But it's also a recognition that in Christ we have incredible freedom. There's release. There's peace that comes from knowing when I walk through the door that is Jesus, He sustains me through all the other doors of my life. Every day you're confronted with decisions, doors, if you will, that you have to navigate. Who are you going to marry? Where are you going to go to school? Are you going to relocate if you get that promotion or not? What about the political world? What about the cereal boxes on your shelf in the morning, right? We have, we have lots of decisions, lots of doors we have to walk through. Jesus is the door you walk through that helps you make sense of all the other doors in your life. Here's the reality. You are going to walk through some doors and make some decisions that are going to bring you into seasons of suffering and trial and difficulty. It's just reality. It's part of living in a fallen, broken world and being fallen, broken people. In fact, Jesus himself will guide you into difficult seasons because he's going to refine and mold and shape you. What keeps us from being anxious about all the doors in our lives is that if we walk through the door that is Christ, we're going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Because if I walk through that door, it doesn't matter what other doors are presented to me in this life. I, if I have Jesus, I have enough. That's why I'm so concerned about anxiety that's plaguing so many of you, plaguing so many in our culture. Remember the analogy we've used over and over again. If you're not careful... The decisions, the doors of your life, if you hold them close enough to your eye, you can blot out the sun. If I hold a quarter close enough to my eye, I can blot out everything else in my life. The door that is Jesus gives us perspective to say, take that quarter down from your eye, see this decision, see this door in light of the door that is Christ. Faith in Christ unlocks a clarifying, anxiety-calming freedom in your life. What does it look like to experience life in his name? Jesus is the door who provides true freedom and true life. Number four, though, Jesus is also the good shepherd. Write that down if you're taking notes. He's the good shepherd. Still in chapter 10, again, the context is chapter 9, where Jesus has healed this blind man. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders are, are, are unwilling to see it. And, and the whole point of chapter 9 is Jesus has healed this blind man, but, but the religious leaders are still blind, right? They can't see. And so in chapter 10, he starts talking about this idea of the shepherd because I think he's exposing the fact that the leaders of Israel will not, were not good shepherds. They were false shepherds. And so Jesus in John 10, verse 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let's get down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. This is emphasizing the fact that Jesus doesn't just know us, he loves us. It's emphasizing the reality that in Christ I have this true, deep intimacy with Jesus, this closeness, this warmth. 
Now, the shepherd-sheep relationship would have been very, very known to these people today. It's less known to us. Here at First Mansfield, though, we have an incredible resource. We have a family in our church that raised sheep for years. Uh, Heath and Misty Fisher and their family raised sheep. And as I've gotten to know them through the years, I've heard many sheep stories. One of the things that's been interesting is to know that when Heath would walk out the back door and the, he would speak or say something, the sheep would immediately come running because they knew his voice. But as much as they raised sheep and as oftentimes how enjoyable that was, they also shared enough with me to know that it wasn't always fun. <laughs> it wasn't always roses and uh, color bubbles. There were oftentimes it's very challenging to care for these sheep. They didn't always love them. But that's not the case with Jesus. Jesus is the shepherd. He doesn't just know you. He loves you. Remember, the one who knows you the best loves you the most. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. That's why we need to listen to him. That's why we need to surrender to him. That's why we need to submit to him. He knows you better than you know yourself. Our culture may tell you that you're the expert on you, but you're not. God is the expert on you. He knows you the best and loves you the most. What I would emphasize is this idea of Jesus laying his life down for the sheep is, again, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection on our behalf. This means that Christ's love for us is not empty words, actions. One of the things I think this emphasizes in my life that helps me think through Jesus is that Jesus doesn't just love me. He likes me. He enjoys me. You ever had a moment, parents, when you love your kids but you don't like them? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I love you, right? You know, there's like gritted teeth and it's tough sometimes, right? I would say, parents, one of the most important things we're learning as our kids are getting older is that they know that we don't just love them, but that we like them. I enjoy Seth, Noah, and Paige. I want them to know that I am proud of them, that I think they're great, that I'm not just here to love them in this kind of mechanical way. I'm putting a roof over your head and putting food on the table. What more do you want? But that I'm enjoying them. I care about them. The reason I think that's so important is because, parents, what we're doing in the lives of our children is we're shaping their view of God. We're giving them a vocabulary from which they make sense of who God is. Now, you are not God in their lives. There's one God, and you're not Him. But you and I are called to be Christ's hands and feet, His ambassadors in the lives of our children, to let them know we don't just love them, we like them. We enjoy them. We're not constantly just correcting and burdened by them, but we see good things in their lives. Jesus doesn't just love you. He likes you. He enjoys you. He delights in you. And when you really experience that, there's nothing like it. <laughs> there is nothing like experiencing Christ's love for you. And what I want more than anything for you, more than anything, is for you to experience and know Jesus' love for you. That's what I want for you as your pastor. Because I know in my life, there have been a lot of times when I think I have known the words of grace, but I didn't know the music. Now, there's a difference between just being able to say, Jesus died for my sins and he rose again, and that capturing your heart. And what I want for you is not just that you know the words of the grace of God, the words of the gospel, but the song of grace has captured your soul, that Jesus is someone you treasure because he treasures you. Faith in Christ unlocks a joyful soul enriching in intimacy. Number five, Jesus is not just the good shepherd, though he's also the resurrection and the life. Flip over to John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Now, the context here is important because Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has died, and he hasn't just died in some random way. He's died because Jesus intentionally waited, if you remember the story. He tells his disciples, I'm going to wait because God is going to be glorified through this in a way that you don't yet understand. He shows up, and he begins to interact with Lazarus' two grieving sisters, right? First of those is Mar Martha. Martha comes to him, Jesus interacts, and then he makes this statement in verse 25. Look at it with me there in your Bibles. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Part of what the scripture often 
causes us to do is to think about death as an enemy we cannot defeat. It's almost as if death is personified as this villain we cannot overcome. Growing up in the 90s, I watched um, a lot of NFL football because we were Cowboy fans, and there was a team, Buffalo Bills, made the Super Bowl four times in a row from 91 to 94. Does anybody know how many Super Bowls the Buffalo Bills won? Not a lot of football fans here. Zero! Now, we, had, we, we were two of those. You know, how about them Cowboys? We won two of those. We have to remember the good times, people, okay? We have to go back and remember the glory days. But it was as if the Super Bowl was this enemy the, the Bills just couldn't defeat. They couldn't get over it. They couldn't get around it. They couldn't get through it. Nothing they did could work. And the same is true for us in death. You can't get around death. You can't run through it. You can't jump over it. You don't have enough money, experience, intelligence, education, know-how. I don't care what your last name is or how much money is in your bank account. Death is an enemy you cannot defeat. But look at what Jesus says. As the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me, there's that word believe again, even if he dies, will live. What is Jesus saying? We're going to experience some of the consequences of our sin. We're going to experience the pain and the sorrow of death in our lives and, around, and the lives of the people around us that we love. But death doesn't have the last word. Jesus, this power, this resurrection of life, who himself defeats death, promises if we trust him, we share in his victory. Remember, the resurrection wasn't just Jesus flexing his muscles and showing us his power. The resurrection was a declaration of victory over death. That's critically important. Death is this enemy that only Jesus can defeat. And if we trust him, we share in that victory. What does life in his name look like? Life in his name means that when I trust Christ, I experience a hope that cannot be taken from me. Real, soul-abiding, victoriously driven hope. Number six, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Flip over to John 14. As you're turning there, let me remind you that John 14 marks a significant shift in the Gospel of John. Big context shift here. Because the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John are, is the sign book or the book of miracles where Jesus is performing miracles and he's teaching publicly. But John 13 through 17 is where Jesus is training his disciples. He's focused, he's pouring into them, he's training them, he's helping them prepare for his departure. And as he's promised his betrayal and his departure, the disciples are saying, what are we going to do without you? How, how are we going to be with you if you're leaving? And Jesus says this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the one hand, this is an important place to teach the exclusivity of Christ. Jesus alone can save us. There aren't multiple ways to God. There's not an American way and a Korean way and a Brazilian way. There's one way. It's a respecter of ethnicity or nationality. It's Jesus Christ crucified and Him alone that saves us. But in this, Jesus is also emphasizing that He's the path. He's the one who connects us, not just to a place. Did you notice what He said in verse 6? Where does He connect us? No one comes to the Father, except through me. Now that's important because Jesus is the path. He's the way to the true God because he is God and he's the one who provides real life. We affirm what the theologians of the past have said when they said, without the way there is no going, without the truth there is no knowing, without the life there is no living. But what faith in Christ does is it establishes a connection between believers and the living God. Jesus is not just getting us to heaven. He's getting us to God who is in heaven. He's establishing a connection now that lasts forever. If you go on a tour of the White House today, most tours of the White House, the president's not there, right? They're not spending an hour talking to the president. But can you imagine how different the tour would be is as you made your 
turn around the hallway to the Oval Office that the president was there. It'd be a totally different experience. You spend an hour in there talking, interacting, asking questions. Your experience of touring the White House would be dramatically different if the president were actually there. What Jesus is doing as the way, the truth, and the life is he's connecting us to the White House with the president actually there. He's not just connecting us to a a heaven that's nice and pretty and fanciful. He's connecting us to a place where there's the person of God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit there. This is not just some superficial, empty connection through Christ where we're sitting in the stands or riding the bench. No, he's establishing a life-giving, rich connection in which we experience God himself. John 14, another part of the context here is this is part of the passages about the Holy Spirit. These are the verses that tell us that the Spirit's going to come and He's going to live within us. The way 14 verse 6 happens, the way this connection, this way, this truth, and this life comes to us is through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Faith in Christ then unlocks a rich, deep connection with God Himself. What does life in Christ's name look like when we believe in Him? We experience this deep connection. But seventh and finally, Jesus is the true vine. He's the true vine. Flip over to John 15, verse 5. Again, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's leaving. They want to know how they're going to live their lives. How, how do they operate in the power of the Spirit as he leaves? In John chapter 15, he uses another illustration to drive home his point. Look at it with me there in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Jesus uses this analogy to talk about our dependence, our reliance upon him. He calls us to remain in him, that is to surrender, to submit our lives to him. This renews this vision of faith as trust or reliance or dependence shapes how we're to live. But it also focuses on the results of our lives. It says that we will flourish, that we'll bear fruit if we're in Christ. If by the Spirit we're in submission and surrender to Christ, that Christ is going to change us. There's a flourishing in our lives that happens when we walk with Jesus. Now flourishing isn't perfection, it's Progression. You might want to write that down if you're taking notes. Flourishing isn't perfection. It's progression. It doesn't mean you're never going to sin. It doesn't mean you're never going to have problems or difficulties. It means there's a general progression to your life in Christ as you're following Him. There's a progression, for example, in your character. Your identity in Christ. Who you are is changing. The way you see yourself, the way you see the world, the way you talk, the way you interact is being changed by Christ. There's a progression in your calling, the vocation, the work that God has given you. It's not just a nine-to-five job. It's not just a paycheck. It's something God has given you to do for His glory and for your good. And part of the fruit we're bearing in our lives is progressing, growing in the calling that God has given us. Faith in Christ then unlocks this vibrant, flourishing life. What does life in His name look like? What does faith in Christ unlock in our lives? and unlocks this flourishing, progressing kind of life. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the true vine. This is life in his name. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, we want you to know that this is what Jesus holds out to you. This life is what he offers you, but the only way to receive this life is if you turn from your sin and trust him, that you repent and rely, that you die and depend on Christ. We would love an opportunity to talk with you, pray with you about that. As soon as the service is over, out these doors to my right, Scott mentioned our next step corner a minute ago. We have people there that are going to be ready to pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. But for those of you that are believers, we're going to finish the service today by taking the supper taking the Lord's Supper. This is an opportunity to remember and recommit to what Christ has done for us. If you are here today and you're a Christian uh, who's been baptized, a baptized believer, we're going to invite you to take this with us. 
The reason we talk about baptism is because of what we believe baptism and the Lord's Supper are. They're two ordinances God has given the church. Baptism is the wedding ceremony where you're professing your faith in Jesus. You're telling the word you're for all of Christ. The Lord's Supper is the renewal of your vows. It's where re- you're recommitting yourself to Christ and to his church. But as we prepare to take this meal together, I want to do something a little different. I want you to turn to John chapter 1. And I want to, I know some of you put your Bibles away, sorry. John chapter 1. I want to look at the, I want to read the first 18 verses of John's gospel. John chapter 1. We're going to look at verse, verses 1 through 18 in just a moment. And I want these words, the first words we read of the gospel of John, to be the last words we've read. And as we read these, let the message of John's gospel ring in your heart and your mind as you prepare to take this supper. Would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word in John 1. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, we read these words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side, He has revealed him. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, as we prepare now to take this meal, God, I pray that this word who was made flesh, this word who died in our place, this word who gave us the right to become your children by faith, that we'd recommit ourselves to him. Father, I pray that we'd recommit ourselves to one another, and I pray that we'd recommit ourselves to the mission of getting the gospel to the world. I pray all this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. You can be seated right where you are. As we prepare to take the supper, I'm going to ask you to enter into a time of prayer again. So if you'd bow your heads with me and close your eyes, I want you to start by preparing for the supper by confessing your sin. The Bible says if we confess our sin... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession and repentance are not a one-time thing, church. Confession and repentance are what we're called to do every day. Take a moment. Give the Holy Spirit some room in your heart and your mind to convict you. Maybe it's something you said this past week or this morning, something you felt, something you did that you need to confess and repent of. But as you experience that conviction, don't let it lead to condemnation. Don't run from God. Run to him as you turn from your sin and turn back to him. Take a moment and you do a time of confession and repentance.
Heavenly Father, we confess that we've not done as we should. We confess that we have sinned and failed in so many ways this past week. We've said things. We've harbored feelings towards people. We've done things. We've thought things. God, we've fallen short of your glory. And God, we confess and agree with your word that that we deserve the wrath and the justice of a holy and righteous God. We deserve the punishment for our sin. But God, we joyfully confess that Jesus took our place, that he took our punishment for us, that he bore the wrath that should have been given to us. We celebrate what the father said to his son, this prodigal son when he returned and said, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. God, we celebrate your forgiveness and mercy. We celebrate that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Church, still in an attitude of prayer, take a moment and give thanks for grace. Receive and believe in the assurance that your sins are forgiven. Father, as we take this meal, we do so with grateful hearts, assured by your grace and mercy. And God, we celebrate and recommit to you, to walking in holiness, to loving one another, and to the mission of getting the gospel to the world. Be honored and glorified in this time. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen.